From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Ropecast with another episode on the results of the referendum in the UK, in which the people of the UK, by a majority, decided they wanted to leave the European Union. And I'm very happy to say that my brother Neil is going to give up a little bit more of his vacation time to be with us today and answer a few more questions and discuss with me. Thank you, Neil, for coming back. Hi, Roger. We want to start with uh, the, the question that Peter asked a little while ago about Northern Ireland. You know, we said uh, Scotland was a separate country for centuries, had its own parliament and so on and so forth. Ireland is very different, isn't it? I was conscious when Peter asked me that question, just how different the Remain vote in Northern Ireland was, strong Mm -hmm. as it was, and yet another difference from what's happened in England and Wales. And of course, the thing I hesitated for and won't hesitate now is there's so much history bound up in this. And I don't really think we've got time to go into 300 years of Irish history. So unless there's a way you can deal with that. Well, we can put links uh, on the website so that people can check for themselves if they want to follow some of this up. Yeah, on on the internet, it's usually under the heading The Troubles. Mm. And of course, it, it covers a period from the late 1960s through until the Good Friday Agreement yeah. in the 1990s. I, I was here for all that time in Germany. It was often reported as a, a Protestant Catholic struggle, which I think is very unhelpful, isn't it? It is, and um, because it was a political struggle, mm. but inevitably religion is such an important part of the history. And when Ireland was divided up, in the early 20th century, after the First World War, what was called the northern part of Ireland was Ulster, yeah. was predominantly Protestant, and of course the remainder became the Republic of Ireland as yeah. it is now, which was predominantly Catholic. Although the border was drawn uh, around what was not really Ulster, but only six of the nine counties, so there we have this rather troublesome border there from the beginning. And I think this border question is now interesting with the Brexit decision. Um, Theoretically, if things go ahead, Northern Ireland will cease to be part of the European Union, while the Irish Republic remains in the Union, and a border that was really rather arbitrarily drawn in the 20th century may become much more significant. I mean, can you imagine patrolling a border like that, um, checking where the goods are going to and fro and so on? Well, of course, there are plenty of people who are listening to this podcast who know exactly what that kind of border looks like. Oh, in Germany, you mean? Because it used to exist in Germany, between yeah. East and West. Well, between, if they're old enough, they may understand that. The yeah. so-called Democratic Republic and the Bundesrepublik. Yeah. So that whole idea fills me with horror. Mm. But, of course, it all depends on how the politics are going to pan out. I think mm. one thing I would emphasize, though, is that people might not realize that the United Kingdom is an island, yeah. but it also has a land boundary with the European Union, and that's the boundary we're talking about between Northern Ireland as part of the UK and the Republic. So how that would shake down, would they have to have border checkpoints, Mm. would there be customs, union officials there, and so on and so forth. Bearing in mind, if you've been to Northern Ireland, you'll see that the geography, the fields of the farmers and so on, make the the idea of a border absolutely irrelevant. We had an Irish guest at this university only a few days ago, who lives in the Irish Republic, teaches in the UK, and cycles to work every day, a much shorter distance than I do here in the Zealand. And he said a friend of his goes to bed in the Republic and then has breakfast in the UK without leaving his house. So this illustrates very well, I think, what kind of border we're talking about. But of course, within all of that, there's the the economic arguments about value-added tax, about where's the cheapest place place to buy petrol. Mm -hmm. And I remember the last time I came to the Zealand, that was Luxembourg, because <laughs> petrol was cheaper in Luxembourg than it is in, here in the Tsar. You'd get all those kind of issues. And, of course, the common agricultural policy, mm. which would apply still in the Republic of Ireland, which is predominantly a country dealing with agriculture, as you know, and the Northern Ireland bit, which would be remained in the UK and therefore no longer part of the EU, but presumably e- no longer part of the CAP. But equally dependent on agriculture. Equally dependent on agriculture, yeah. So it's going to be a very difficult transition, however we look at it, in in Ireland itself. And I think um, one of the parties on the side of the divide that wants a united Ireland has already said we should start to discuss 
reuniting Ireland. Yes, which of course would is likely to ignite deep, deep feelings of unease amongst the so-called Protestant community yeah. in Northern Ireland. Well, we went through 30 years of violence, bombings and shootings, and nobody wants to return to that kind of situation. Now, perhaps the podcast listeners, if they're, if they're younger than maybe 25, won't know that 3,500 civilians were killed in Northern Ireland mm-hmm. over that 30-year period. It was a very bloody war. Yeah. Well, let's move to something a little easier to talk about just to round things off for today, Neil. And that is, um, obviously, for a long period now, there's been a great deal of at least scepticism about the EU in the United Kingdom. And it's very widespread and it comes from somewhere. And I think some of it um, from the media, from some elements of the mass media, especially newspapers, which have put out stories saying stupid Brussels decision about straight bananas or I don't know what. There's a large number of these myths. There are. And I have to say that one of the main proponents of these myths is Rupert Murdoch. Um, He owns a significant share of the UK media, both newsprint and radio and, of course, Sky. And he's known to be absolutely against the European Union because he says it has blocked some of his business development opportunities, Mm. particularly on the restrictions on monopolies and on telecommunications monopolies in, uh, in general. But of course, we as individual citizens, we've had to rely on the EU to defend us from those uh, large corporations that obviously want to get their own way. So we come back to this idea that many people deciding yesterday were doing so more on the basis of emotion rather than rational considerations of the pros and cons. Yes, and I, th- I would dare bet that if you spoke to many people about those myths, and I see you've got a piece of paper in front of you with some of those myths on. I remember straight bananas, yeah. but there were other things as well which were laughable at the time. Yeah. But like a drip, drip, drip of a tap, some of these things people remember mm. and they forget that they are, in fact, myths. Yeah. Well, again, we'll put a link on our website to this list of myths and how they've been built up over the years and which publications have been most responsible. Thank you very much, Neil, for being here again today. And that finishes the podcast, but we'll be back again very soon, uh, listeners, with uh, another topic on another day. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. Thank you.